progress. Well, good evening. Um, and happy Sabbath, even though it's not Sabbath yet, it will be Sabbath. But let's uh, begin our study with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so very thankful for the approaching Sabbath hours, for the blessings of this week, and the burdens that are upon our heart. We know there's many people who are facing difficult times. People in this message, we lift up Hung and his wife from Vietnam, uh, who's in the hospital with uh, bleeding in her brain from an accident. We pray that your healing hand can be upon her and that you can give the doctors wisdom and that you can bless them. Uh, we are thankful, Lord, for the things that we have to study, of the truths in your word and the light that has shone upon our past, path this past week. And we just pray, Lord, that we can have the strength through thy spirit to um, walk on that path. That we can be faithful in the little things that you give us to do each day. Be with us now in this study. May your Holy Spirit speak to our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> now, I'm actually going to put this other microphone in here. It's better sound now. You probably weren't getting great sound. Well, good evening, everyone. And um, as you can see, we're, we're continuing our study on the presidents of the United States. Now, I, I, I'm wanting to, to close up this study. That's sort of the plan um, to, to sort of tie up some loose ends. But there's lots of loose ends Lots of little things that um, that we haven't fully studied. So I'm going to go back and just kind of give a review of of what we had studied. So this began on December 25th. That is not our personal study, but uh, Colin had presented this study called "Dividing the Gold" in um, in the Sabbath morning. Uh, presentation sermon and he had proposed this idea that uh, we could take the presidents of the United States and line them up and, and I've gone through this many times but just go through it again so he took Daniel chapter 3 in this golden image and he could see that this is the Sunday law and this is also uh, something that happens under the time of the United States. So he could say that this is United States. Even though it's Babylon, it's still the U.S. And then he could take the image of chapter 2, which has Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome, and he could tie that together to our understanding of Revelation 17, which is going to have those same powers. And by tying this also to the the study on Daniel chapter 11, verses 1 to 3, where we went through uh, the kings of Persia, the last seven kings of Persia, um, or where we, we, we started to tie that in to the kings of Persia, to mark Trump as Xerxes. So this goes way back to late in 2015 that that first happened where we looked at Xerxes, then we could make this prediction that Trump would become president. And, and, and Jeff had this suggestion, or he was teaching, that Trump would also was typified by Alexander the Great. And so Collins sought to preserve that initial interpretation. Now, it's an interpretation which I didn't personally accept, but I didn't oppose. I did talk to Jeff about it on two occasions. But... Um, you know, I didn't see the logic of it then, um, but I didn't have a way to really demonstrate what was wrong about it until after um, July 18th and then after Trump losing the election to Joe Biden. And then, then we began to understand that. And I, and I put out a paper prior to um, – January 6, 2021. It was actually in connection with what happened um, in November of 2020 within this movement, um, where we were studying 
Daniel chapter 11 uh, and, and starting at verse one and, and trying to go through and because we knew that Trump had not won the popular vote yet and there was a disagreement within the movement, what was going to happen? Was Trump going to somehow retain the presidency or was Biden going to have the presidency? And we didn't know at that time. So I wrote a, a paper on the presidents of the United States. But in that paper, I already started to understand what was happening. And this is before January 6th. So, but January 6th kind of confirmed it for me in that um, what we had done in, in our understanding of that, we were correct that Trump was Xerxes, but we hadn't at that time uh, addressed the other kings of Persia. That is, we used the verse, so I'm going to go there. Uh, in Daniel chapter 10. So in Daniel 10, near the end, uh, actually the last verse, verse 21, um, it says, But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth, and there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael your prince. Now, we then say, well, when we go to chapter 11, also in the first year of Darius, the Mede, even I stood to confirm and strengthen him. So he's going back and reflecting upon what happened um, because this is in the, in the time of, of Cyrus. He's going to reflect back on what had happened in the first year of Darius. And, and so then he's going to, and then he's going to talk about the future. Now, I will now show thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia. So we know that's Cambyses, False Myrtus, and Darius, Darius the Persian. And the fourth shall be far richer than they all, that's Xerxes. And by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir, all, stir up all, that is all of his kingdom, against the realm of Grecia. So that he's, and that's Esther chapter one, where Xerxes has this 187 day feast, uh, first 180 and then a seven. So that's, it's, it's a symbol of July 18th. And uh, there's lots of symbolism in there. We know that uh, uh, we've, we've gone through the story of Esther, but the main thing that we can see there is that we have this with Trump, we have the July 18th prediction tied in through Xerxes, through Ahasuerus. And then we also have the story of Esther itself which we could then connect to the Sunday law. That is, we would connect that basically death decree uh, to the death decree, but they're types, right? So our argument when we were going back through the story of Esther is that this was representing this movement that we were experiencing a type of the Sunday law, which we could see in the pandemic. And that that would be tied to Xerxes, that is to Trump. Trump was deceived in being involved in, in uh, what, what happened with the pandemic. So, so, so there's, you know, there's lots of parallels there. The one thing that we noted is that that Sunday law in the story of Esther isn't connected with the third decree, but only with the second decree. That is, it's connected with the second angel's message. And so my suggestion is that we could look at Samuel Snow's letters, his history, as being typical of this movement. We could look at Ezekiel as being typical of this movement and the story of Esther being a typical of this movement and the time in which we live. So we have these parallels there. So when we would look then at a mighty king shall stand up in chapter 11, verse 3, I didn't see the reason that we could then continue on. This is something new. And, and it's not just that, that um, Alexander the Great stands up. We know actually a whole history is going to unfold. We're going to see the globalists, which is going to be Greece. But the globalists go through this um, conflict, the king of the north and the king of the south. And in the end, the king of the north is going to be controlled by who? Who's going to cont control the north? Uh, 
in the book of Daniel. Because it's Greece is the king of the north and Egypt's the king of the south. Well, I mean, not Greece, but Syria. So, but that's all Greece, right? So it was all part of the kingdom of Alexander. But when we get to the end, the king of the north is triumphant. And who is then the king of the north as we progress through Daniel chapter 11? Who does that power move to? Okay, so it moves to Rome, right? Now, Rome is not Greece. Who is Rome? Okay, so when we get to Daniel 11, verse 31, an arm shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. What power is referred to here? What's the abomination that maketh desolate? And is this power the king of the north? Hopefully you guys are following what I'm doing. If I don't get feedback, it's hard to know whether you guys are following the, the discussion or the, the study. So is this still the king of the north? Because when we go back, the, the la so when we go back and we look at Daniel chapter 11, so we're going to go quite a ways back. We know when we get to verse 11, the king of the south shall, south shall be moved with choler and shall come forth and fight with him, even with the king of the north. And he shall set forth a great multitude, but the multitude shall be given into his hand. We know this is raphia. And when he shall have, when he hath taken away the multitude, his heart shall be lifted up, and he shall cast down many ten thousands, but he shall not be strengthened by it. For the king of the north shall return, and shall set forth a multitude greater than the former, and shall certainly come after certain years with a great army and with much riches. And in those times there shall be many stand up against the king of the south, also the robbers of thy people, which is Rome, shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fall, right? So Rome is going to exalt itself to stand uh, to establish the vision. It's going to participate in this victory. And then it says, so the king of the north shall come and cast of a mount and take the most fenced cities, and the arms of the south shall not withstand, neither his chosen people, neither shall there be any strength to withstand. But he that cometh against him shall do according to his will, and none shall stand before him. And he shall stand in the glorious land, which by his hand shall be consumed. So who is this power that's being talked about? This king of the north. Our understanding of this, if you look at uh, Uriah Smith, he's going to say Rome conquers Syria and Palestine. So, that, And that's, that's really the simple, plain reading of this. So now the king of the north is Rome, correct, in verse 15. Because in the conquering of Egypt, Rome becomes a partner in this. And Rome ends up really taking over what we would call the, the territory of the king of the north. So Rome becomes the king of the north. And so it's going to talk all about that history, right, um, of the early part of Rome, of how it's established, establishing itself in Palestine. Um, 
where we're going to have uh, the league and all these different things that occur. And then um, we're going to get to verse 31. And R shall stand on his part, and he shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily. And they shall place the abomination that make it desolate. So we know that who's that the arms stand on the part of who? Who are the arms standing on the part of? Who are the arms? Okay, it's the papacy. And so who are the arms that stand on his part? Well, it's the armies of, of France, right? So France is going to be the group that puts the papacy on the throne of the earth in that period of time. You know, beginning with Clovis, they're going to take away the daily, and then France still continues to be that power under that guy, uh, Justinian, right? So you have France putting the papacy on the throne of the earth, and it's going to be the one that takes the papacy off the throne of the earth. So it sets them up, and it places the abomination that make it desolate. Um, so it talks about persecution that's going to happen there. It talks about uh, the time of the end coming, for it's yet for a time appointed. Um, and then it says, and the king shall do according to his will. So this king here is the king that's been referred to before. As Uriah Smith says, um, he says it can't be the same power, right? So he accepts all the way up to here. But now he says when the king is introduced, he says, well, if it said a king, right? So he's going to have a king uh, being placed. And I can't try to find where he actually says that. Um So his arguments against this being the papacy are not very good ones. But anyway, we know that this is, is still the papacy. And, and, and the indignation, what's the indignation? He's going to prosper until the indignation be accomplished. What's the indignation referring to? Anybody? You guys aren't very talkative. I get a few comments in the chat there, but what's the indignation? What indignation has to be accomplished? Okay, so it's for the north. So that's the, these two desolating powers. The indignation is the 2520. So that 2520 is going to end in 1798. So that's going to mark the time of the end, right? So it goes on and talks about the papacy and its characteristics at, at that time during the 1260 years. And, and then it says in verse 40, and at the time of the end, so that's going to be at the end of this indignation, shall the king of the south push at him, so what Uriah Smith tries to do is he tries to take uh, this verse um, 36, and the king shall do according to his will as being France. And, and so then when the king of the south pushes at him, that's going to be Egypt. We did a whole study on this and how the pioneers understood this, not just Smith. But they were trying to take the events that were happening in their time and they were mixing literal and symbolic. And we can see the parallel to our time. That is, our movement has made the same mistakes that the Millerites did. And, and since we're repeating Millerite history, it's understandable that we would do that. Now, they're, they're expressed in different prophecies, but it's the same idea. And, and it's, some of it's connected to the same prophecy. So, so they're looking at what's happened with Revelation chapter 9, and they understood that when uh, the sixth trumpet ended, the second woe ended, that that would be a close of probation, and that the seventh trumpet would begin to sound. And, um, 
So they connected a close of probation there. Now, as time went on, they moved that over to October 22nd, 1844, or even to the uh, the 11th of, um, or the 13th, pardon me, the 13th of uh, October in 1844 as being the close of probation, but initially, and then we moved it to October 22nd. So, so when we get to verse 40, which of this movement is founded upon is the understanding of this, of this. At the time of the end, shall the king of the south push at him. We know that the king of the south is no longer Egypt. Um, it's going to be France. And the king of the north shall come against him. Well, the king of the north is, in this case, the papacy with the armies of the United States. The papacy gains the military strength from the U.S., and, and we know that's 1989, when the King of the North pushes, or when the King of the South pushes in 1798, and the King of the North comes against the King of the South, which now is the USSR, in 1989. Uh, and he comes against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and many ships. So that's military and economic might, which is American in this case. And we know that Louis F. Weir predicted this event, not the date of it, but how it would occur based on Daniel 11, verse 40, and his understanding of these two separate parts, A and B. Now, he didn't place the time of the end, a secondary time of the end at 1989, but that's what this movement does. So we would say we have a repeat of Millerite history, and this verse, Daniel 11, verse 40, gives us this period of time uh, from 1798 to 1989 as uh, the span of time in which uh, this this is going to be accomplished. So, so we end up with two times at the end. Now, I understood this back in 1989 regarding uh, what had happened prophetically, but I did not put a time at the end there. I just knew that I'd read Lewis F. Weir. He placed that as... Um, uh, the fulfillment of the second part. And so when it was fulfilled, then I knew, okay, he was correct. Um, and then the next part dealing with the glorious land. So the glorious land here is not going to be Palestine. It's going to be, or, or the church, it's going to be the United States. Right? That's our understanding of it. the glorious land here is the U.S., and so I'm not going to go through a whole study on Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. But what we can see is that this history of the king of the north and the king of the south, we went back to Daniel 11, dealing with Raphi and Paneum, and saw a parallel there. So, so what we had done is we had said, well, Raphi and Paneum are going to align with Midnight and the Midnight Cry, and we have very good reasons for that. Um, but we had set those up as being connected with November 9th and July 18th. So November 9th was Raphia, July 18th was Paneum. Now, of course, Raphia, before we got to Raphia, Jeff had already recognized that many of the events that were being predicted were not going to occur. The only thing that was going to occur was this separation of the two classes within the movement. But yet we still expected... Um, our prediction regarding Nashville and so forth to be fulfilled on July 18th, even though we were being shown that that prediction would fail. And we should have known that it would fail because November 9th didn't meet the conditions that we needed. But we just kept shifting how we were understanding these things. But after July 18th, with the retirement of Jeff almost immediately, um, we now had this situation where uh, the movement was trying to sort out what had happened. Um, and many people in the movement left. They just felt that the numbers, the chronology, the symbols, that they were just misleading, they were satanic. Uh, basically, they reject, many of them just rejected the entire message as not being from God, um, in spite of all the evidences that God had been leading us, and especially the parallel with Millerite history, which we had already been teaching that we were, we were going through. 
So it really didn't make much sense to say, well, we fulfilled Millerite history too closely now, so we must be wrong. Um, because there was this anticipation that, well, if we're following Mr. Millerite history, wouldn't we have a disappointment? And the question is, what would that be? And the only thing that made sense is that July 18th would be that disappointment. So we, we now in this movement are experiencing the history after October 22nd, 1844 in type. And um, we have this, um, um, how do we put this? So if we look at early writings, page 70, we have a situation that's very similar. We have the scattered flock and, and we have, um, we're trying to sort out our message. And that's really in the context in which when we get to December 25th, 2021, the end of our 777 days of that structure, starting at November 9th, 2019, we have this, this new light. And this light is correct to some degree. That is, we can't just dis dismiss this as some kind of error. That would not be wise. So, so that's where this, this line moves through. And the question is, how are we going to then address this? So what we did, and initially when, when um, Colin presented this, and the next Friday I did a presentation where I wanted to address the study, what I, what I thought we needed to do to understand this. And that is we needed to go through our other lines. And we talked about the kings of Judah, and also uh, the kings of Persia and understanding that better. Um, but one of the first things I did is I went to a study by Ralph Myers dealing with the names of the popes. Now, some people are familiar with the idea where people would count the popes to try to figure out which pope was going to be the, um, the last pope. And, and really this was a, a mixture of uh, Catholic prophecy uh, with Adventist prophecy. And it's something I have opposed for a long time. Now, there's this page. Now, I, in order to find it, I have to go to the Wayback Machine, which is web.archive.org. And you can look up uh, there, you can see at the top, www.666beast.net. It's interesting, there's 252 captures, but that's just a coincidence. Um, uh, it's just how many times they captured this website while it was um, uh, in operation. So can, can you explain a little bit about that, Aran, what this capturing is? So they started from December 5th, 2001 to the 14th of March, 2022. So this Yeah, is, I think you, you said it pretty well. It's just however many times it got backed up. Yeah, so that's kind of interesting that it's 252. Right? And, and it's not going to change now because that site doesn't exist anymore. So it's, it's not like a total that we just happened to look at and it's – you know, it's continuing, correct? Okay, so so I think that's kind of interesting. Now, uh, at this time, when they had done this, it had been last updated in May 2020, uh, but they had done a capture on March 14th, 2022. So he didn't update it anywhere from, from May 20th or May 2020 uh, to March 14th, 2022. So that's almost a period of two years. But we know he um, he passed away, the guy who did this website, uh, Ralph Myers, um, last year in, I believe it was, I uh, can't remember if it was August 31st or August 30th or something like that, or August 1st, I can't remember. It's, it's there at the beginning or end of August anyway. Now, so this study he had done, and there's uh, different developments of this study, because you can see he first presented it in 2001, and this is in 2001, who was the Pope? Uh, 
John Paul II. Yeah, so John Paul II was still the Pope. And I, I can't remember the exact date where he died, but then we ended up with Pope Benedict. And so prior to this, what, um, what Ralph Myers was saying is he had done this numbering, this counting of the names of the Pope. So let's see if I can, well, maybe I should just do it this way. Okay, so maybe this one works. Okay, so this is going to just bring us to, no, it's not going to help us. It's not going to bring us to the page. Um, well, what we have here, this is this list. <clears throat> so we had worked out who are the real popes and who weren't real popes. So there's anti-popes, popes that were deposed and so forth. And so you know Pope Benedict's the 16th, but there was a pope that's not counted. And Pope John, um, there was no Pope John 20. So Pope John 22 doesn't count. And um, so when, when we looked at this before, we just simply, we, we noted that there was this idea that these, these seven heads were going to be these Pope's names, Pius, Leo, Gregory, Benedict, John, Paul, and John, Paul. So John, Paul, and John, Paul, right? So you got the seven, seven different heads. Now, um, in this idea, um, we would there's some problems with this idea as far as the riddle is concerned so if you go five are fallen one is and one is yet to come what would be the difficulty with this papal heads how how would that riddle apply Wouldn't that be saying that there has to be more than two popes? Well, well, so it's dealing with the names themselves, right? Correct. Okay, so so Pope Pius is the Pope, Pope Pius VI is the Pope in 1798. So five are fallen, one is. Uh, one is yet to come. Now that could be and I, and, I, and I can't remember how he addresses this, but I mean, it could be John Paul. But when he continues, he continues a short space, and then there's going to be this other pope. So originally, um, he made some kind of application there to these names. So he's not looking at the individuals. So that's one of the differences with Ralph Meyer's understanding of this, is that he's not looking at the individuals. Um, he's looking at the names because we're gonna count the number of the name. Now, the way that he does it was the thing that intrigued me the most, because when you deal with the number 666, the way, one of the ways it's arrived is by adding uh, progressively the numbers one plus two plus three plus four plus five, all the way up to plus 36. And when you do that, you will come to the number 666. Now, what he's doing here is he's taking each of the Pope's names and how many popes have that name. And for each time the pope has that name, he's adding again, just like we would in the Babylonian magic square idea. So you're going to have uh, one plus two plus three, all the way up to plus 12 Pope Piuses, and that's gonna give you a count of 78. And then he's gonna do the same thing with Pope Leo, where he's gonna have 13, Pope Gregory 16, Pope Benedict 14, because he's not counting Pope Benefit, Benedict the 16th, and one of the other Pope Benedicts, I can't remember which one. And then uh, also he's not counting Pope John or the 20th, because there was no Pope John the 20th. So, so he's just giving the number of the counts of John. So each of these he's going to add up. And then he has the two John Pauls, so that's going to give him plus three, so that's one plus two. And then he's not going to count Pope Benedict the 16th, who um, resigned under suspicious circumstances. Um, and, and then Pope Francis is going to be the one, the plus one. He's the, the new name, right? He's the, the eighth. But 
and he's of the seven in sen in the sense that he's he's a pope but he's definitely not one of the seven so and when he adds these up they add up to 666 now this is not a very likely outcome that is we don't have you know we're not just going from 1 to 36 to getting 666 because we have much more than 36 here but the fact that we can end up with this number even though we're not counting benedict the 16th but we get francis so back when he originally had done this in the 90s he had uh, predicted that there would go be one more pope and that pope would have a different name than the other seven names since 1798 but when benedict got elected he then believed that benedict was going to be deposed now, benedict re resigned which is a little bit different but it's close i guess close enough for him and then when francis became pope then he he had exactly what he wanted but remember he had made these predictions long before he didn't wait until there was a pope francis uh, to do this you know we're, we're talking about something in the 90s um so so there's some intriguing things about this now i don't dismiss it completely that is i don't think he's wrong that is i think he's he's maybe wrong about some of the things that we're looking at here uh and maybe even the significance of benedict because we have an unusual circumstance we have a pope that retired uh, with an, an another reigning pope in existence and it wasn't something that anyone expected. So even though Benedict doesn't get deposed, um, I think it's quite significant that he resigned. But what does it mean specifically? Because when we're addressing these, um, these heads, because Francis isn't gonna be around forever. We're gonna have another Pope probably at some point. I mean, Francis is pretty old. He's he's relatively healthy, but, you know, we don't know how long he's going to live. Um, but the question is, what is this bringing us to? That is, if we're doing an interpretation or an application, such as Ralph Myers does here, I think that there's something that actually speaks to this movement more than something that speaks to the entire history. That is, we can take an application of this, what he has done, and we can apply it to our time, to the time of this movement. Now, does anybody remember exactly when uh, Francis became Pope? And I, I meant to look at these dates of these popes. I looked at them one time, started on it, but I never did finish. Um, because when Benedict resigned, then you know they had to pick Pope Francis. Does anybody, I mean, I can look that up quickly. Okay, 13th but, of March of 2013. Okay, and so what was the significance of 13th of March? Well, you would have this as 130313 as a date. Okay. What else? Fatima. Fatima. Okay, what what you're saying there, Brian? I didn't quite catch it. Fatima. Uh, okay. The thirteenth. Okay, so so we have this symbol of the thirteenth, which is Fatima. Okay, so what does that have to do? Then, can you can you explain a bit more? So we we know that it's going to be, it's not in March that they first see. Uh, Fatima, you know, this, the, the children in Fatima see this uh, lady. These are the apparitions, the Marian apparitions in 1917. They go from May 13th to October 13th. So, so why would we just pick up on this 13th and connect it? Is, is there a connection? March 13th. Yeah, we got that there. So May 13th to October 13th.
Any thoughts on that? Other than than, than just why why would Fatima be important there, the thirteenth of May or March? I mean, I was just making a thirteenth connection, uh, but it's very very weak. Okay. Um, well, I don't know if it's totally weak, but it, it, it definitely it definitely is not um, exactly what we would we would want. So, um, how would I do this here? I'm trying to find something. Um, okay, do we have any other other thirteens in connection with the Sunday law? Let's Let's put it that way. Um, okay, what about the 13th day of the 12th month? What's that? Anybody know? And how's that connected to a Sunday law? If I said the 13th day of the 12th month of the 12th year, okay, this is Haman's decree date, okay? So again, we have a 13. So does that help us a little bit more? Now that date's going to be March 7th in, um, so I'm just going to go here. This is uh, one of my charts here. So this is going to be March 7th in um, <clears throat> in 473 uh, BC, right? So we're going to have in 474 BC on the first day of the first month, I have marked over here, there's going to be this casting of lots. And there's going to be uh, the decree is given on the 13th day of the first month. There's a period of three days. Um, um, so have these different uh, dates marked. Mordecai is honored and hanged Haman. Um, and then you're going to have Esther's decree 66 days later. That's the counter decree. And then uh, you're going to have, um, which is going to be the 23rd day of the third month, 323 days after um, this day before Mordecai is hanged. It's going to bring us to March 7th, 13th day of the 12th month of the 12th year. You multiply those together, you get 1872, and, and that's March 7th. But it, you got the 13, day, 13 there connected. So is that helping us in understanding Pope Francis as far as his chronology? Are we barking up the wrong tree here? Is there something connected to about Francis that we can connect to our history symbolically? Okay, so, 
So the 13th day of the 12th month was March 7th, 473 BC. Can we connect that to Pope Francis, the date of his election? Is that just stretching things? There's also, it's in 2013. Possibly a doubling of Satan's power, Satan's number. Okay, the two thirteens there. Mm -hmm. Now we also have other things. Uh, pope Benedict, he becomes pope on April nineteenth, two thousand and five. So he has a symbol attached to him. Now, of course, you know there's lots of different dates, uh, you know, that could have been symbolic and so forth. Um, but he has this April 19th date attached to him. Now he retires on February 28th, 2013. So it's going to be another, I guess, 13 days or two weeks. I guess that would be technically 13 days, two full weeks from when his papacy ends to uh, Pope Francis becoming Pope. Is that significant? Do you understand what, I, what I'm saying by that as being significant? So the date that um, Pope Francis becomes Pope is March 13th. That date is February 28th, Julian. So, so we can see that those two dates are connected by 13 days. So we have the number 13 in the year 2013. We have the number 13 in the date. And we have... Um, the 13 days between them. So is there significance of these three 13s then? Because isn't March 13 about three 13s? Does that seem reasonable? I want people to... If I'm being unreasonable about this, just let me know. Makes sense to me. Okay. So, so we can see that Pope Francis being elected has significance. And even though we don't, we don't agree with everything that Ralph Myers taught, we can say that there are things that we could connect uh, the history of the story of Esther that you see here. We can connect this with our history, which we've already done, and that we have Pope Francis in 2013. He becomes the Pope. And is that significant for this movement? Is there anything significant about that time within this movement? What's happening in this movement at the time that Francis becomes Pope? And, and, and is it significant? Okay. 
Okay, the Joel controversy, right? So we know that there is some things happening in connection with... Um, now, when it comes to uh, the two tables presentations, so Jeff was doing these presentations. Now, I don't know the exact date, you know, and, and I wish that I did, and maybe somebody knows this, but when... Um, uh, Emmanuel, uh, um, what's his name? I'm just getting names mixed up here. Um, oh, I can't think of his name. Who's the guy who came up with with um, uh, um, Ezra seven nine? Emiliano, right? Does anybody know when Emiliano did his presentation in two thousand? Well, he didn't really do his presentation. He came up with his study. He got very sick. Does anybody know when that was? Was that in March of 2013? Because on the FFA website, they don't, they don't date the, um, the videos. Um, regarding the Happy Cooks 2 tables. But we know that Jeff started them in 2012. He had a little bit of a hiatus and finished them in 2013. And, and I was watching the morning me meetings at that time. So I don't know exactly when that occurred, but I believe it was around the time of March. Now, it wasn't until August, now maybe it was later, but in August of 2013, uh, Jeff presented this, well, he didn't present it, it was actually in between his presentations, and he asked some questions regarding uh, the calendar. And, and I might have been finishing a presentation or something, I can't remember. Um, so, so when we... When we look at this, okay, so we're going to... Um, can can we connect what's happening in the movement with with the death of Pope John Paul II, or not the death the the uh, the res resignation of um, um, Benedict and the election of Francis? Does that have anything to do with our movement? Because we have this Joel controversy that's going to be rising. Uh, there's that controversy going on in 2013. It, it doesn't really get known by generally in the movement until 2014, but <clears throat> how would we connect this? Is there something happening then that's typifying what's happening now? I would say that there would have to be, but I had to step away for a moment, so I'm not fully up to speed. Okay. So we're just talking about when Francis became Pope, and that's in March of 2013. And it's it's around this time that we get the light on uh, Ezra 7-9 through Emiliano. Right. Um, and I'm pretty sure it's around there just from my memory, because I know it was before I was married which I got married in April 8th, 2013. So, so I know it was before that. So you're going to have Pope Francis become Pope. There's things happening in this movement. Um, and even though we don't accept Ralph Myers, you know, he's not part of this movement, he is an Adventist. And his understanding, there's some intriguing things about his interpretation that he's using to... Um, to count the names of the Pope. Like, I, I think it's a valid argument. Whether he gets it right or not, that's another question. But the fact that he could come up to 666 with just this unique name of Francis, and that it puts us on the 13th day of March, 13 days after Benedict re resigns, 
in the year 2013. And and it's also where it's near the beginning of uh, the 13th back tune, right? So remember on December 21st, 2012, that was 1,872,000 days since the start of the Mayan calendar. And so that comes into play as well. So we have this 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 period of time that's that's quite quite interesting within this movement. And it's going to lead to the events that we're going to see happen in 2014, where we see the separation uh, begin in, in a clear-cut way. So, so I would think that this is important in understanding our lines. That is, the beginning of these lines is connected with that history, the 777 structure. Not just the 777 from November 9th, 2019 to December 25th, 2021, but all the way going back to the mind calendar change that occurred, going to the 13th back tune. So then we have uh, uh, all of this history begin to unfold in the areas of chronology. So, I mean, I've been in the movement since 2010, but in 2013 is really when chronology uh, begins to become an issue. And first dealing with the 70 years captivity in all the periods of 70 years plus then we end up in uh, 2014 with the presentations on chronology so so there's a whole bunch tied up in there so I'm trying to get you to to really think this through that we have these applications of the heads of Revelation chapter 7 and 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 some people who came late when we look at this, uh, the Wayback Machine here, the webarchive.org, and this website, the 666beast.net, um, there was 252 captures of this website. I guess they take pictures of it. Um, from December 5th, 20, 2001 to March 14th, 2022. And because Ralph Myers had died in uh, August of... 2021 i guess he didn't any longer pay for this so his website went down so it's that number is not going to change it'll still be the same the 252 captures so so we can see the symbolism even here on this website part of me is whoops, 254 captures it says now so i'm not sure how that works so changed what if i do that again that's no, 254. So why did it say 254 or 252 and now change to 254? It could be specific right. to whatever page you're looking at. Oh, to where I'm on a particular page. Yeah. Okay. Well, this one says 254 now. So it said 252. It said 252. doesn't anymore. So I don't know. And I, I think that's the same page, though. So I'm not sure what happened there. Uh, you're not sharing it right now, but I think it was from the main page. To... Okay. Anyway, well, yeah, I'm not sharing it. You're correct. So sorry about that. So now it says 254 times, but it did say 252, which you can see earlier in the video. So I'm not sure what that meant. Uh, but yeah, anyway, so March, they said to March 14th, well, we've got March 17th. Oh, that's 2001, November. Anyway, I'm not sure how this works, how they do that count. But they changed it anyway. But what we have is we have this witness um, with these symbols. Oops. I don't know how to get there again. I guess I'm just going to go here. There's the most recent one. Um, it's just loading, it says. Okay. Now it says five captures. Oh, so it depends which date I'm looking at. Is that what it does? See, this capture doesn't have anything on it. Um, I think it depends on that URL that you're seeing there. Okay. 
So if I go here, it's going to give me a different, well, it still says 254 captures. So I'm not sure why. Okay, so anyway, going back, so we reviewed, we reviewed this idea, and, and we see some light in it, but we, we can't say that everything that Ralph Myers says about the name of the papacy is we're going to have the last pope. But there's something similar in his approach where he's making a prediction, but it doesn't pan out. And, that, and that's kind of the main point, I guess. So we can see that it has some characteristics. Now, if we followed Miller's rules, could we just say, if we, we have a par partial fulfillment and it doesn't work, then we just need to start over again. Would we put that kind of application to this? Um, I mean, because that's how some people have approached it within the movement. We, we made a prediction, it didn't pan out. So if we're going to follow Miller's rules, we would then have to say we were wrong. Now, we, we looked last week at, <clears throat> at these lines. So this is, again, uh, the, 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 the kings of Persia. So according to the scripture of truth, then, what Colin is going to suggest is that what comes after Xerxes is not Artabanus and Artaxerxes, even though they are mentioned in the book of Daniel. But we're just going to jump to Alexander the Great. So that means in our line, we're going to go from Trump and we're going to go to Alexander the Great, which is Trump again. So I still, maybe I don't fully understand Colin's argument. Somebody had written, and, and try to explain why there's two different counts. So remember we talked about the counts where Darius the Mede is not counted here, but we're going to count Reagan here. So if we do this count, Trump is the sixth. If we were to count the count the way we are doing here, Trump is the fifth. So we can say, we can look at our prediction that we did with the presidents of the United States. And, and, and can we see that these are complementary? That is, what he's doing counting the names of the number of the Pope, numbering his names, and us counting the presidents of the United States, what is the similarity between what we're doing? Uh, and what is the distinction? if that makes sense. Like what are we counting that's, that's the same? And what are we counting that's different? Is there a parallel between these applications? Are they complementary? Anyone? Anyone have any thoughts? How could they be complementary? Okay. So anybody want to answer? Because that's kind of the question I'm asking. Even though they're different, so they're, they're taking Revelation 17, and they have completely different interpretations of them. Can they in any way be connected? That is, we're not taking this as the primary application, at least I'm not. Um, of Revelation 17. I'm going to take the pioneers' view as the primary application because I think their view is consistent. But we're making an application regarding the presidents of the United States, this movement is. And Ralph Myers made a, uh, an application regarding the popes, the names of the number of the pope. Is there any way in which those reflect each other, whether even in a negative or a positive sense? I'm not saying that that they're true or not true, but just in what they're doing, is there any way that they complement each other? 
any way in which they're parallel. Are they making similar types of errors? Yes. Okay. So what is the parallel of the errors that they're making? That's that's the question. That's part of the question. They're attempting to use a literal um, presentation for something that should be more figurative. Okay, so the heads, um, okay, what would be the difference between something literal and figurative in the case? So if we look at the pioneer's view, the pioneer's view are that there's the different forms of Roman government. Um, now we know people, there are people who just label them as the popes, you know, since the Lateran Treaty. Um, you know, some people try to do that. Um, so in what way are they mixing literal? What are they doing that's literal? That they taking, shouldn't... taking the name of the people where the pioneers, like you were saying, they were using the types of the government. Okay. Now, I mean, the thing I like about Ralph Myers is taking the literal popes as heads. He's taking the names, is he counting the number of the names? So that would be something that would be fairly um, symbolic in that case. He's not taking it uh, in the way that people mostly would take this. Um, and, and the thing that I like about it is how it parallels the counting from one to 36, adding each number successively to come to 666. So he does that with these names of the Pope, and it's not something that would likely occur. Um, and, and I like the fact that he got to 665, because that reminds me of Ezekiel chapter 8, where you got the fifth day of the sixth month of the sixth year of Jehoiachin's captivity uh, that's going to start the vision of the Sunday law. But I, I think that the error that they're making is, is it's not so much just the literal and symbolic problem. It's the time element of where they're placing it. That they have this problem in applying the riddle. Because that's what we saw last week with, with Colin's study, at least in the way that I understand it. The count doesn't work quite right. Now, is this paralleling anything that this movement has done prior to, you know, what Colin's presenting here? Is there some way in which what Ralph Meyer was, was doing, even though it some, had some elements that were correct, that there's something that we have missed as a movement, as Seventh-day Adventists, when we're trying to look at Revelation 17 and the question, what is it? But is there some parallel? So the other thing, too, just before we answer that question, is we can see that one of the things nice about Ralph Myers is it's addressing the papacy, and Collins is addressing the United States. Right? So these are two, that's the, the beast and the false prophet. We don't, we don't have the dragon here, though I would argue um, that that there is some connection when we look at Revelation chapter 12. And if, and if we looked at all of these, we should see that chapter 12 deals with the dragon, chapter 13 with the beast, and chapter 17 with the false prophet. So, so there's something here, but there's something that's missing. Right? And, and, and I wish I knew, like I don't necessarily have the answer to this. But I don't think that we can just discount any of these things as just error. That is, I have seen error in the past. I've seen people who've tried to apply prophecy. And when they do that, they tear apart the foundation. And while I see problems with Collins' application, 
if he is tearing apart the foundation, it's a foundation that maybe isn't wasn't well laid. That is, I'm not talking about the main foundation, but things within this movement that we didn't quite get right. That is, the Millerites had things that they didn't fully understand. And, and this is making us look at these things and trying to sort through it. Because I believe this movement has to sort through this. I don't think we could just dismiss this. We saw this with Odilio's material. We couldn't just dismiss what he was saying in his study on Nero. Because we have July 18th there and October 13th and month as these symbols. And, and we couldn't just dismiss what he said about um, the mandates and the pandemic, even though we may not agree, at least I don't, with a lot of his, his theories about what's happening and who's doing what uh, and where it's going to lead. Um, we could see that the symbols there of July 18th were connected with it. And we know that that's already been connected with our history. That is, he's tying that in this connection with the 777 days. And then we can see this also with Collins. There's something here that has to be seen. And I know that sometimes we don't like to look at something that we disagree with the conclusions and then, but have to admit that there are some things correct about it. So one of the things which I'm going to get, just go back to that I believe was correct had to do with the chronology. So if we go to my charts here, that we had um, these 65 days dealing with the election on November 3rd to the Siege of Washington. And we had already marked the Siege of Washington. And then we're going to have... Um, from the midterm election, we have this structure of 65 days as well that we can then connect in this various ways to the symbols of July 18 and the 2520 and the calendar, etc. So we have all of these symbols from the November election to Biden's inauguration is 78 days, which is 1,872 hours. And then we also have from Trump winning his election to Biden's inauguration being 1,533 days. So we, we know there is something here. That is, we can connect Trump to the siege of Washington, to Biden in these different structures, to the midterm election being 2,190 uh, 2, days, which is 219 French Republican weeks. So this is a ratio of seven to 10. So from Trump's election to Biden's inauguration is seven times 219. And from Trump's election to the midterm election is 10 times 219. And, and the 10 and seven, that's what? What's the 10 and seven symbolize? Doesn't that symbolize the 10th day of the seventh month? Yes. Which is the 187th day of the year, the Jewish year. Right. Agreed. Right. So, so we have all of these symbols. So as much as we don't like some of the conclusions, or we might disagree, or we might have problems with it, I don't think we can dismiss Colin's study. I don't think we can dismiss Odilio's studies. I don't think we can dismiss... Ralph Meyer's studies as insignificant. There's something there that has to be understood by this movement. And, and we have to be able to separate the chaff from the wheat. And, and our natural human way of doing things is when there's something that's not quite right, we throw out the baby with the bathwater. So I'm mixing metaphors there, but, but you, you get the point. And so this movement can't afford to just ignore something we don't like or we don't agree with. And how that's going to be sorted out, how this movement is going to do that, 
I don't really have any idea how that's going to be done. So all I know is what I've been able to present. So we've examined, uh, I think, I believe this is study number 20. So we've examined, you know, 20 studies here particularly. And of course, we had Colin's original study. So we're dealing with 21 weeks um, of looking at this, if I got my count correct. And I don't think we've actually drawn a solid conclusion. We just know that there's something there. Can we at least agree on that point? I would think so. Okay. So if we can agree on that point, um, we know that God has give, been giving us other light. That is, we've been doing other studies, and these studies have been significant. Uh, you know, particularly the study that we had yesterday morning, in which we recognized that there was 777 days from the start of the camp meeting when they first had the chart the 1843 chart, it was first presented at the camp meeting in, um, I can't remember the name of the place. Anyway, at Kingston or something like that, uh, I think there was like two parts to the name. Um, and, and, and it's two from 70 to the start of the Exeter camp meeting, right? So let me see if I can find this chart of Stevens here. Yeah. Yes, here it is. So East Kingston, that's what it's called. Now, this is one of the charts, but there we go. So you got the first Millerite camp meeting. It's actually the first Millerite official camp meeting. And it's the charts were advertised on, um, I believe it was June 20th, that they were going to be out in a few days. Oh, I didn't hit the share button. Sorry there. There we go. Um, so it's East Kingston beginning June 28th, 1842. And it's going to be and he doesn't have that here, but, well, he has some of it. So he's got the 777 days, which is an inclusive count, to the beginning of the camp meeting at Exeter, August 12th. So it's 777 days. And then you're going to have, uh, on the 14th, you're going to have Samuel Snow. Um, at the camp, you're going to have Mrs. Couch, who I believe is Samuel Snow's sister who's going to say that there's a brother here who has light on this, and that's going to be this uh, fight against this fanaticism. It's going to be light that's going to overcome the fanaticism from the Waterton tent. And then Samuel Snow is going to present three messages on August 15th. And that's going to be 780 days after the start of the Eastern Camp East. And we know 780 days is 18,720 hours, a symbol of July 18, 2020. Now, he's also going to do presentations on the 16th. He's going to repeat some presentations and, and, and deepen the impression. And that's going to be 781 days, which is going to be, uh, in reverse, a symbol of 187. And um, now, Rand says, yesterday was 217 biblical also. And 217 is a symbol of midnight, right? 217, the 21st day of the seventh month. So it was the 17th day of the second month, but it still can be a symbol of that. So, so we had all of this light that's been coming to this movement. And, and what I want to do, so we had done a presentation on Sabbath, last Sabbath. And we're going to have another presentation, not this Sabbath, but the following Sabbath, well, you know, eight days from now, on um, 2030, the Great Reset. 
And I'm thinking that I want to pick that up also on the Friday nights. That is, I want to look at this um, finished. So, so we would say that this study on the presidency of the United States, we've, we've looked at a lot of things. We haven't come to some solid conclusions yet, but maybe that we can come back and visit this in those studies dealing with the Great Reset, that maybe light will come from that study that will help us to understand this better. Does that seem reasonable? Reasonable approach? Yes. Okay. So any, any final thoughts? I mean, I've been just amazed at what God has been doing. Um, I wish I could keep up in, in the way that I want to. I have a lot of papers that I have to finish. Um, that I started, I, but I, often I get a lot of papers started, but then th different things come up, so I move to another paper. So I got quite a bit of writing to do, and I have to get stuff ready for the studies next weekend then. But um, any final thoughts on all of this? I'm just going to have to go back and review some of the things I've missed. Yeah. Okay. And um, now Stephen had put out a paper, by the way, on dealing with the camp meeting there. And I'm writing a paper. I disagree with Stephen on, on his conclusions, but I'm pretty sure I can persuade him uh, that he's wrong. Um, but I'm going to put that down in a paper as well. So, I mean... We're studying these things. I might be the one that's wrong. He might end up convincing me, so it's hard to say. But um, we're still trying to understand fully what happened at this camp meeting. Now, the thing that I just want to say about this, then, is here we have something that has been foundational to this movement, but we did not understand it correctly. That is, we didn't have a correct understanding of the events that unfolded at the Exeter camp meeting. And that's because we were we were relying on a few different sources that were actually in disagreement. That is, we had James White's account, who was there as an eyewitness. We had uh, Joseph Bates' account, who was also there as an eyewitness. Um, and, and those two are, to me, the primary accounts to, to, to consider. But then we have Loughborough's account, who's not an eyewitness. And then we have uh, Arthur W. Spaulding's account, which again, just um, taking these other accounts and weaving them into a narrative. But we find that there's problems with Loughborough's. So um, I'm going to try to get my paper done this weekend, uh, see how successful I am. And I'm going to you know, try to work with Stephen a little bit, uh, but to get these things sorted out. So we got some nice charts. And we have a nice uh, study that we can look at again. And I believe that the movement really needs to look at these things. I, I, I mean, I think it's something that the movement can agree upon to look at and to try to understand that there isn't something that, you know, people would say, well, you're doing something with this we don't like. Uh, I would like to see everyone in the movement reading Stephen's paper and reading my paper or whatever paper it is, the paper we make together, whatever it's going to happen, and understand what's happening. Because I do think that the understanding of what happened at Exeter is important for this movement at this time, because God's given it to us at this time. So those are the things that are coming. Of course, we have uh, Dwight's study tomorrow morning at uh, um at our usual uh, 7.30 a.m. Mountain Daylight Time, which is going to go to 9. And then Heidi and I are going to go uh, at, right at 9 o'clock because we're going to go to Warburg, and I have to give some of my papers to one of the, the guys who's followed this movement somewhat but doesn't have the Internet. So um, so we got to do that. And, uh, and then we have the week morning studies. Uh, again, of course, 7.30 a.m. Mountain Daylight Time. 
and and those are getting very very interesting as you can see by what we found the connection between um, Gilgal and Bokim and and this history so um, any any final thoughts now okay well, let's close with a word of prayer dear father in heaven we are so very thankful for the sabbath and we just pray lord that you can uh, continue to bless your people help us to follow and serve you help us in our studies and um, i pray that you can bless those who watch these meetings online and those who are studying and searching for truth, that your angels can be around them, that your Holy Spirit can speak to them, and that you can bring a conviction upon our hearts of the things in our lives that need to change, that you can show us a revelation of Christ that can break us and make us undone, that you can remake us into your image. Be with us now. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.